Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RegimTo.com video, we're going to be tackling three news stories which have popped up over the past 24 or so hours, as usual, of the technology variety. The usual caveat, it is a little bit noisy in the background because, well, I have to have a couple of windows open because it is so bloody hot here in the UK. I'll do my best to remove any excess noise post-process. So, what pieces of news do we have to cover? The first of which is Threadripper, and the fact that it supports one terabyte of RAM. NVIDIA moving on to MCM, also known, of course, as multi-chip modules. And then we're going to finish the video with Global Foundries, and it is released its plans for its 7nm process, which it will roll out in a three-phase generation, and it will start in the second half of 2018. So before we begin, one small thing, I am also in the middle of conducting, well, just about to start, rather, a review for an X299 motherboard, as well as two processors I've been sent from MSI, so that will appear over the next couple of days, and that will actually form the springboard, the basis of a number of projects that I've been working on, but I actually put that project on hold because I wanted the results of this uh, review first, so I can basically do that. And, well, we'll find the results very interesting, I feel. But, with that said, let's jump in. So, Threadripper is, of course, the HEDT CPU from AMD. It is poised to take on Intel's X299 platform and will sport the high end. 16 cores, 32 threads, and it is due to launch on July 27th. But one story that hasn't really seen so much attention is the fact that this CPU will actually um, support up to one terabyte of memory. This is according to Robert Halleck of AMD. Experience, and then this CPU also supports gobs of RAM, so okay. video editing being very memory intensive as well. Uh, you could go up to a terabyte if you wanted. Oh, wow. When he was interviewed for Alienware's official YouTube channel. I must confess I am very much looking forward to the performance of Fred Ripper. I think it's going to be very interesting to see how X299 and um, Fred Ripper managed to compete against one another. I don't feel many are actually saying that it's going to be a wash and that Fred Ripper is going to be all round the better platform. I don't know necessarily if I agree with that. I do feel there are going to be usage cases where Intel do have the upper hand, but, and this is going from the leaked pricing, of course, AMD have not officially released the pricing yet, but from the leaked pricing, it does appear that Fred Ripper is the better value proposition at least. Switching from Team Red to Team Green and NVIDIA, more specifically multi-chip modules. Basically, this is NVIDIA's way, as well as many in the industry actually, of skirting around Moore's law. So, NVIDIA are working with Arizona State University, the University of Texas, and Barcelona Super Com Supercomputing Center, excuse me, and... Their joint efforts have put together a paper which looks together, which looks at improving GPU performance, once again using multi-chip modules. So this workaround is essentially because transistor scaling can't continue to happen at the pace it has been. If you were following computers from, let's say, the late 90s and perhaps even early 2000s, maybe even until very early zeros, you'll notice that Processor scaling went up quite significantly. You had faster clock speeds, you had shrunk processors, which meant you could have more cores on the same amount of space as, as the previous generation, more cache, blah, 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 blah. I think most of us understand that. And of course, this can't continue to happen. And this is one of the reasons that we're looking at other technologies other than, well, silicon. But until those technologies become prevalent in our society, we need to look at other ways of doing this, and the paper really encapsulates this by saying the performance curve of single monolithic GPUs will ultimately plateau, and um, using high bandwidth and high performance signaling technologies, we're going to basically manufacture GPU modules to create multi-chip designs. This was actually a little bit like, uh, not exactly in the same vein, before I get a thousand comments that tell me this, but not exactly like it, but this is one of the reasons that clock speeds didn't continue to go up and up and up and up and up and up and up. 
Uh, I've said many times over, of course, that the Pentium 4 was originally designed to go to 10 gigahertz with the netburst architecture. It didn't happen. And one of the reasons we've seen the whole go wide design is because constantly ramping up clock speeds was just a fool's errand. It not only produced a lot of extra heat, but it just wasn't the most efficient way of doing things. So efficiencies do play a role in this. So the idea here, at least according to the research that they've developed, is that, well, let's put it this way. They originally had, they, they looked at the possibility of a 256 SM MCM GPU. God, that is a lot of acronyms. And what they did is use simple building blocks of GPM and have advanced interconnects and they have ch achieved a 45.5% speed up over the largest possible monolithic GPU with 128 SMs, which is pretty damn impressive. So what's basically happening here is that the and the various modules, of course, are connected with high bandwidth lanes, and that means that each module knows what the other one is doing. If you need a visual representation, and obviously there will be some inherent differences, but it would be a little bit like Ryzen, how it is built on its own in independent blocks, and AMD have been doing very similar. I suspect that this technology will probably find a home in Navi as well and be very similar for it. So NVIDIA are probably not going to be able to incorporate this for its graphics cards for a couple of generations. So certainly Volta obviously has been and gone. So maybe a couple of successes after uh, Volta will start seeing the fruition of their work. Either way, personally I'm quite excited about this. And it basically means we don't need to worry about shrinking um, processes forever and ever. And I do suspect we've seen Intel, of course, also start to move towards this whole uh, multi-chip uh, design as well with um, Basin Falls. So obviously it's just kind of how it is. Right, I've got a good segue for you because now we're going to talk about 7NM and Global Foundries. Global Fan Foundries, excuse me, are of course the one of the manufacturers who produce the actual silicon. They are perhaps best known for producing a lot of AMD's GPUs and CPUs, but if you do a quick look at their website, they have actually over 250 customers worldwide, and this actually spans across multiple different locations, and, and 14 to be exact, and over 18,000 employers, employees, excuse me, God, I can't talk today. So in other words, they are a pretty big and influential company. So of course, it is very important that we take a look at their 7LP platform. So currently, generation 1 of 7NM um, is going to hit uh, at around the second half of 2018. There is no exact release date here. Increased performance, lower power. High density, uh, high high transistor density versus LPP14. Now, this is quite interesting for those who do not know. Ryzen is actually designed using 14 nm LP, uh, yes, 14 nm LPP. So, basically, if you were to take a look at the roadmap from um, AMD, you'll spot that Zen 2 is actually using a 7 nm design. And then Zen 3, which hits around 2020, 2019, something around those lines, is going to be using 7NM+. And this coincides rather nicely with 7NM Generation 2 from Global Foundries, which increases yield and lowers cycle times. And also, reasons for EUV insertion is to reduce usage of quadruple and triple patterning. Finally, we'll have Generation 3 which is improving performance further, power, and area refinements. So it's probable that we're going to see AMD be very thankful for this. According to their official slides, and usual caveats is going to be, you know, running at the same clock speed, sorry, at the same wattage and that type of thing. But still, uh, you could be looking up to a 40% boost uh, in performance over 14 nm. So 7 nm offers a 40% boost, which is absolutely monstrous. And power consumption, if you prefer that to go that route, you can have a 60% improvement in power reduction. So when you consider that, that would certainly be a boon for, let's say, portable devices. It is worth noting that many would say, well, you know, they might be just about ahead because by the time, oh, I don't know, 2019 comes around, you're going to have Intel with set with 10 nm. And this is true, but... As many in the industry will tell you, you can't necessarily 
uh, equate one manufacturer's process with another because there are definitely inherent differences on the way things are manufactured. Uh, Samsung will be moving by the time 2020 hits. You're probably going to be about 6 nm. TSMC is going to be 5 nm and so on. And once again, you can't actually compare these because, well, there are definitely some differences between them. So I think that just about covers this topic. Hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'm starting to hit my stride again and have just put up the Z270 review for the KB Lake motherboard as well as, of course, the 7600K CPU. So things are becoming a little bit smoother here now on the channel. I will also have the X299 uh, motherboard review up, up in about a weekish. I'm aiming for, as well as the other uh, follow-up to that, which is more, let's say, exploration. But you'll see more what happens when I put that video up in probably about a week after that-ish. So anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.